Previously on Funny Science Fiction. Is the last question, what is my name? Because I think, I think we would even struggle there due to our previous <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Hi, I'm Larry Steger, and you are listening to the Funny Science Fiction Podcast. Uh, the podcast where, like Stormtroopers, we always miss our targets. It's that our jokes are the targets. And like this one, it wasn't very good. Our guest today is an accomplished on-screen and voice actor who has well over 200 credits uh, to his name. If you do some research on him on IMDb, kind of like we did, uh, you'll see that you've noticed him on shows like Young Sheldon, various Justice League animated series, Star Wars, Old Republic games, there's some Star Trek appearances, and so much more. We are so very honored to have Larry Cedar join us today. Thanks for being here, Larry. My pleasure. Good to be here. My privilege. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to do this. I've I've been wanting to have you on the show for a while, and, and ha now to have the opportunity to sit down and talk with you. There's so many things that I want to talk to you about, but uh, we're going to try and keep it uh, just to a few questions. So, sure. uh, But before we get into anything that's even remotely sci-fi related, I have to talk to you about one specific thing, because uh, you had posted something on Facebook a while back, and it blew my mind because I did not realize it was you in the show, and that's on the show Community, yes. um, where... Uh, you play the father of, of Chesy, Chevy Chase. Uh, you are the character Cornelius Hawthorne. And I didn't realize it, like I said, until you posted that. And immediately I'm like, really? And I, I went to IMDb and I'm like, oh my God, he wasn't kidding. That really was him. And so I asked, I wanted to ask you about this because Community is one of my family's favorite shows. Um, we love that show. Uh, your character cracks me up just how how far outside the realm of, of reality he really is um, with his, you know, his views on things. But I have to ask about the wig. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that that molded plastic, ceramic, whatever it was. Right. Um, what in the world was it made of and how uncomfortable actually was it? All right. So before I answer that question, I just have to tell you, first of all, that I've told people this before. My favorite compliment that anyone can pay me in this business is that they didn't know it was me. I take that as the ultimate compliment because as a character actor, I like to disappear into my characters, uh, not just for the satisfaction of it, but as an acting you know, task. And, and when you tell me that, that, that thrills me because I like to do that. I like to become another person. That's for me, the fun of acting. Awesome. So thank you. Uh, now onto the wig. Okay, so the wig, um, and I can tell you a few interesting things about this character. The wig was um, foam. It was made of foam, so it was very comfortable. It was like, no, okay. I've worn a lot of strange things and some very uncomfortable prosthetics and things. Uh, this one was nothing. Uh, but they did do a head cast on it, uh, and they molded it, and it's supposed to be solid ivory. In the story, he's supposed to wear a solid ivory wig because he doesn't want to wear, he's very um, uh, prejudiced, backwards person, and he doesn't want to wear the hair of uh, any foreigners who might have contributed to the black hair. So he's, he's really messed up. Right. So he wears an ivory wig, and all he has to do is buff it. He has to get it buffed. <laughs> so it was very comfortable. Um, that was the least of the challenging things about the show. The hardest thing was they decided to make me old by layering in pieces of paper with glue. So they would apply, they'd scrunch my skin, put the paper on glue, and it would stay kind of scrunched. And so they did that all over my face. It took a long time to apply. I think it took even longer to take off. It was just a mess. Uh, but it did make me look pretty bad, skin-wise and age-wise. Yeah. It really <laughs> was very effective. Now, I tell you this, when I auditioned for the show, they had a whole different concept for the character. He was supposed to be so old that he couldn't even walk. And he was rich enough that he had purchased this mechanized uh, bio suit, ectoskeleton, <laughs> ectoskeleton. And he would push buttons and it would move him. And he worked all jerky. And at one point in the original script, he loses control of the power source and it starts to speed up. And he starts walking and running all of it. And, said, you know, and finally, of course, it blows a fuse and steam comes out and explodes and all that stuff. Then, they, of course, they decided, well, that's going to cost a fortune to make. So they cut it from the character. Right. So uh, he was always going to be an interesting guy. I was very grateful. I loved working on the show. Couldn't have been a nicer cast. So friendly, so welcoming. Of course, incredibly funny. Uh, their yeah. timing, their sense of humor, the writers, the direction. It's a top-notch show. So I was thrilled to be mm -hmm. on it. Had a great time. Yeah, that's uh, that's one of our favorites. And it's yeah. it's one of those shows that we kind of circle back to. And we'll watch that show. Like it, it, We call it background shows at our house. Yeah. Uh, because it's one of those shows you can have on in the background and you can be doing all these different things, but you'd never lose pace of what's going on in the show. And yeah. you don't have to pay like pristine attention to it. Cause you're not afraid you're no. going to miss a detail. You know, no. it's, it's like, like, 
you could tune in any five minutes of the show and you'll be laughing. It's just classic. Yeah, absolutely. And so you right. come back to it time after time and it's still funny. So Yep. I agree. I agree. And Chevy Chase, oh. who I idolized when I was growing up, is just as funny as he was back then. He has this um very impish quality about him where it's just everything he looks at he figures out the funny, you know? So I had a good time with him. I found him to be, uh, he, we didn't talk that much um, outside of the set, uh, but on the set, I found him to be a very generous uh, performer. He really tried to find the relationship between myself and he really treated me like I was his father. Uh, and uh, so I had a great time, really great time. Very grateful to have got on that show. That's cool. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of people and actors that I've talked to, they've been inspired in some way. What was it that inspired you to become an actor through some of the voiceover and stuff? You know, I was on a different path. I was supposed to go to law school. I've been accepted to law school, but in my heart, I'd always wanted to be an actor. I'd done it in high school. I found that when I was on stage, I felt more alive, more connected to who I was. I felt like I was meant to be an actor. Everything of about the way my body worked and my instincts uh, naturally fell into the acting world. But I set it aside to prepare to go to law school. I got into law school and uh, on a last minute impulse applied to graduate school in theater just to see what would happen, not expecting it to, anything to happen. I got accepted and like a light bulb went off in my head and I said, it's like a, like a door had opened. I said, you've got to go through that door. And I, all, he had, all I had to deal with was my father explaining it to my father, but he wasn't, <laughs> he, he wasn't too terribly upset. He was disappointed. But later on, flash forward, I got him into acting after he retired and he ended up enjoying it quite a bit. So I knew he understood. So I would say what inspired me was, as I said earlier, the opportunity to disappear into different worlds and characters. I have, I have a vivid imagination. And to me, acting is time travel. You move into these other, I've become so many characters over the course of my career. I've been so fortunate. And they stay with you. And it's like you've gotten to travel into another dimension. So it, it fed the imagine, imaginative part of my mind. And it also felt, and I'm sure you've discovered this, that when you find what it is you really meant to do, it's very fulfilling. You say, I know who I am. And uh, when, I, when I found that out, when I realized it and I was able to pursue it, it I just found it completely fulfilling. And I felt like my, my life was finally on the right path. So um, those are some of the aspects to it. And on top of that, I'm a curious person. I like to read. I like literature. Um, I, I find the world of acting allows me to explore all sorts of things, all sorts of worlds that I'm naturally, naturally curious about. So, um, and then of course there's the applause and the laughter and all those ego things that come with it. But I gotta be honest with you. It's not my main pursuit. I approach things to, to, uh, to benefit from the challenge of that particular role or project. And of course the laughter and, and, and the money, if you make it uh, is wonderful as well, you know, but artistically it's very satisfying. So what you're telling me is a real life quantum leap. It's a real life what? Quantum leap? Yes. So it's a it's solution. Or... It absolutely is. And the, the more committed you are to the character, the farther down that in, into that universe you go. And uh, I've had roles where I still have some roles I haven't let go of, that they're still in me. Like if I was called to do that role tomorrow because it had such a, a meaning to me and it opened up such a part of me and I felt so connected to it that it's, it may never leave me. Certain roles I've done, like, you know, like Leon on Deadwood. I played Leon on Deadwood. Mm -hmm. That guy will never leave me. Uh, of course, I did it for longer than any other role I've ever done. I was on that show for three years. But that character is always going to be right here for me. And it's almost like you have a collection of friends that stay with you. So, yeah, it is a quantum leap. That's, that's, that's a good way to put it. Nice. All yeah. right. So as the, being an experienced actor, both in front of the camera and in front of the microphone and yeah. i know that you've done a lot of of playhouse style work and and yes. things along those lines um clearly we as we've mentioned and alluded to there's been so many characters that you've been part of right. do you find that you have to prepare differently for your work depending on the type of media that is being presented in or do you have a set method of approach that you use in order to get yourself ready for that for you know a carte blanche project well it's interesting because each if you're talking film versus television versus theater versus commercials versus voiceover versus uh, animation, yes, they're all technically difficult, uh, technically different. But I would say the overarching um, requirement, and it sounds simplistic, but is become the character. Become the character. Now, whatever that entails, when you're doing theater, there's a more sustained preparation. 
And the reason is you're going to be doing it eight shows a week. So you can't just go on your impulse once or twice like you might do on film or TV and then move on. You're going to be doing that character. So you need to have it deep inside you. So there's a slower build, slower approach. You go into something like television. If you're a guest star, you're lucky if you get a blocking rehearsal, maybe some direction from the director. Probably not because they've got so much other technical stuff they got to deal with. And you got to jump into that character. So you have to have a kind of a looser feel. You have to have more of a sense of, you know what, whatever happens, I'm going to go with it. You can't think too much. In theater, you think a lot. You have the time, the luxury. Television, just go there. Just like I said about voiceovers earlier, I think before we started, just just go there. Sometimes you're required to just to be there, be that guy. Sometimes they're saying, well, let's talk about them. Let's, dis let's explore, let's discover, let's rehearse. So the goal is always the same. Become the character. Put yourself into that world to the degree that it is believable to the audience. They believe you are that person. Then they will, they can come along on that ride with you. If they don't believe you're right there or committed, then they're detached and they lose interest. The best uh, uh, shows or performances are the ones where you totally believe that what you're seeing is really happening. So for me to bring the audience there, I've got to be there. So the answer to your question is a different preparation. Yes, technically, timing wise, uh, the particulars of the medium, yes, different. And I could go into those individually, but it would take too long. But uh, overall, when I get a role, the first thing I see is, how do I become that guy? That's all. That's it. I have to say, I, I, I really appreciate your answer. And I like your answer quite a bit because now I've talked with other actors and I've asked them a very similar question to that. Mm -hmm. uh, not exactly word for word, but pretty similar. Um, and I think that yours is the most concise answer that, that I've gotten as to how you're approaching not only your work, but how you approach your character and how you're, how you're seeing it. And I think that helps us, the, the, the non-actor world, kind of see, you know, how you're getting into it, how you are moving about with your character and, mm -hmm. and how you're approaching your craft. And I, I yeah, for me, I, that was just really nice. It helps me to understand how you're going about it. So thank yeah, you. And I think actors are, are those people who are willing to leave themselves and go someplace else for the benefit of their audience like this. They're very willing to, I'll become that person. Not only will I, but I want to. So that's the, I would say that's the actor instinct is I have a desire and an inclination, a natural inclination to become somebody else. And that person could be someone who's similar to me in terms of contemporary. He could be, you know, my age and it could be very close to me or it could be someone extremely different from me. Um, very often actors will say that the roles that are closest to them let's say like I'm, I'm in my 60s, a guy like me, contemporary, are the hardest to do because there's no character to hide behind. You're the most exposed. That's when you have to reveal more of your who you are. If it's an extreme mm -hmm. character, you can almost become that character and hide behind it and have fun. But sometimes the toughest ones are when it's most like you because you have to be the most vulnerable. So each role will have its challenges. Each role has its unique challenges that you never can say as an actor, I know how to act. Done. Never. Because every new situation, every new role is going to, going to present different challenges. And that's not just including what I have to do for myself, but who you're working with. Uh, the director, the set, the costume, everything's going to have a unique set of challenges. And you just have to go with that, you know, whatever. And, and just say, whatever happens, I'm going to roll with that because I, I want this stream to continue. I don't, want to, I don't want to be the one that messes up this process. I want to contribute to it. You have to be very game and willing. The great thing about this industry, I find, is most people who are in it love being in it and they're excited. So you come together with people, like-minded people who also want to create something magical and special and you make this thing. Then you all go home and you move on to the next one. You know, it's a lot of fun. Awesome. Yeah. Definitely. So you have like a big, long list of credits. As I was going through them, I saw many different genres that you've been in. And so is there a show that when people ask for like a recommendation on something and that you've been in, what would be your first choice and why do you think You mean a show that I, I think that they'd really enjoy that represents maybe perhaps what I feel is my best work? I would say sure. Deadwood. Deadwood. There's no question. Okay. Deadwood, um, I was very lucky to get on that show. I was brought in to audition for a one day guest star. I happened to look, they always say the joke is they cast the guy that fits the wardrobe. I happened to look like a character they hadn't cast yet called Leon, who was supposed to be a very thin, redheaded opium addict. And mm -hmm. I walked in and they went, oh, you're here for this, but you look like Leon. <laughs> and 
I said, oh, OK, who's Leon? And they said, well, he's this guy. He's, he's only going to be on the show for a couple of weeks, but I think he'd be better for that. And I said, great. So um, so I, I got that role and it ended up going for three years. You never know what's going to happen. The reason that show was so good is they had the money. They made amazing sets. They took sometimes up to three, four weeks to, to, to shoot one episode. So they, did, they made it right. They had a tremendous cast, tremendous writers. And uh, it's just a quality level that you don't often have the good fortune to be a part of. You know, you know the production triangle? Have you ever heard of the production triangle? It's No, I haven't. Three points. It's fast, cheap, and good. And oh, you can yeah, only okay. You can't have all three. They, they had all three on Deadwood. And that's why it eventually went away, because it just was unsustainable. It was too expensive to have quality and speed. And what was the third one? Uh, speed, speed, fat, well, I can't remember what the third one was. But it was unsustainable, but it's rare. So that's the one I would point people to. I would say, if you want to see, you know, the best, the best quality work I did that I'm most proud of, watch Deadwood. Watch Deadwood. I'd say that's a really good choice. As highly rated as that show was, and yeah. every, you know, I think uh, I think Rotten Tomatoes gave it like a ninety-five percent, which is for yeah. you know for Rotten Tomatoes, that's that's pretty good rating. Yeah. So yeah, I was I, like I said, I was very lucky because I wasn't even meant to be on that show, and then I got I don't know. So I just I constantly look back and I go, how did that happen? There's a lot of really brilliant actors out there mm -hmm. who may never be seen because they didn't have the lucky break. They weren't called on that one role that made them. Or they weren't given the opportunity to show just how good they are because they had to spend a lot of time doing smaller roles that didn't require as much or have the depth of character. So, it, you know, we all accept that as actors. You know, you there's luck involved and sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. But when you are fortunate enough, you just, you never forget it. You know, I think Ian McShane was a, a very successful actor uh, on many, many levels. He'd proven himself. But when he got Deadwood and became Swearingen, it just took him to a whole other level because people were able to see just how good he was. I mean, you know, and he was exceptional, but he right. never had that kind of opportunity before that, that series. Right. So right time, right time, right place, right time, right place. And boy, did he fill those shoes. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. yeah. Did, did you, did you tell him that you had some concerns about, you know, the fact that they thought you looked like an opium addict right off the bat or. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that. I'm, I'm always so much more interested in the darker, stranger characters. When I said, opium addict, great. What else? Has he got a tattoo across his head? Tell me. The more bizarre, the better. I mean, I am, I guess I am what you call the definition of a character actor because I'm happiest when I'm playing weird, strange characters. I, I never want to do the same character twice. I'm still finding other characters I can do. And I, I want to explore all that because to me, I'm not a writer, but if I were, I'd want to write in novels that had all kinds of characters and explore all kinds of worlds but i leave that to people who are far more qualified to me my job is to bring those characters to life but i, I just find that this is the this is the wonderful thing about about acting is if you're given the opportunity you can just become all kinds of creatures and people and you know and most character actors will tell you that they're happiest when they play a wide range of characters there's other actors who just want to be themselves i just yeah. want to be me i want i want to be famous for being me if anything, my problem in this business is that I'm not the least bit interested in anyone knowing about Larry Cedar. But I, I'm not that interesting a person. I'm really not. Uh, I'm not interested in, well, interviews like this are good because I like to talk about the biz, the craft. But if people right. want to know about me and my life, I'm like, why? You know, I'm dull. My characters are really interesting. <laughs> so that's, that's, where, that's where the interesting part of my life is. And if anything, it's held me back because I have no interest whatsoever in promoting Larry Cedar. I just don't right. find me that interesting, but I find the characters really interesting. Well, see, that's what makes you of interest to a show like ours, because we like the characters. We like, you know, we want to talk about the roles, the characters and what you're doing and, and how you prepare for them and, you know, right. what they mean to you and all these different things. Yep. Uh, reminds me of a conversation we had with another character actor named Larry, uh, Larry Hankin. We had him on the show a while back mm -hmm. and uh, he expressed a lot of the same things that you you did just just right there. He he's more interested in the, the story of the character and, and, and how they, you know, how they fit into it. He didn't care if if people liked Larry Hankin. He was more concerned that people liked the character that Larry Hankin was playing. Correct. Now, there, there are some people that believe, uh, if you want to get kind of mystical, or, or uh, that these characters exist in the universe. They're just out there. And your job is to find them, connect with them, bring them into this world, and then let them go again. You know, And, uh, and so you feel a responsibility as a character actor to that, that spirit. Uh, I, I started a whole uh, Twitter feed about Leon after he was killed. Leon was killed in the last episode of the last year of the series. 
And I created a character called Leon's Ghost because I felt him so strong in me. I felt he still had so much more to say. And I started tweeting these, these thoughts from Leon every day. And you can, you can still check it out. It's still there. Um, and uh, just what he was saying from beyond. Like he was dead and he was still roaming the streets of Deadwood as a ghost. And he was watching these people he knew. He was watching the man who killed him and commenting on him. He was watching the woman he loved but knew he would never get because he was an opium addict. And, but he was so lonely, but there's nothing he could do now. But he could follow her through the streets as a ghost. And I, I, this guy was still in me. And it was almost scary because that, that was Leon. And, and uh, so that's my job is to honor the character, honor the character. And if you're working for, with great material, um, you know, sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. And whatever, whatever you're given, that's the job. But sometimes you work with material that's elevated. And the good material stays with you. This is why Shakespeare is so great, because it's incredible material. Now, I did King Lear in a production, and I couldn't let go of that guy for six months. I was still running the lines after the show closed, because good material captures humanity and what it is to be a human being. It's so true mm -hmm. and honest and insightful and enriching that you just don't want to let it go. It's like eating you know, high-quality food. You know, It's just better. So if you're lucky enough to play interesting characters, they'll stay with you. And it informs your life. I like to feel that who I am. If Larry Cedar is anybody, he is a collection of all the characters he's ever played. They've come into me. You think I'm going into them, but no, they came into me. And I reference them in my life, what I've learned from them. So it's a, it's a really magical process. Uh, it's addictive. It's addictive. Excellent. Yeah. So, so knowing that now be the character, would you like to redo the introduction as well? Re redo the... <laughs> Uh, hello and welcome to the funny thing. Oh yeah, I know. Your character, right? At some point, you got to say who you are. You got to admit who you are. Oh okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got to at some point come back to it. My wife always, you know, says to me, she says, you know, because whenever there's an opportunity to promote myself, I'm always like, no, it's okay. And she goes, no, no, you got to do that. And I go, I know, it's part of the business. Uh, but uh, yeah, like I said, I'd rather talk about my characters, you know. And, and the process. I do find the process really interesting. And it's funny. I don't think of myself as a veteran actor uh, because I just feel the same as I did when I started. But I have accumulated a lot of characters and credits. And I have. I am older. And I do know some things that I didn't know 40 years ago. So I'm happy to share those because uh, I do learn over time, certainly by your mistakes. And so it's, it's, it's nice to be able to share those, you know. Awesome. Yeah. So... Larry, another thing I noticed on, on Facebook is that, uh, and I've watched several of them, you have some live streams that you do uh, with a process, and I'm sure I'm going to slaughter the name here, and so I apologize first and foremost, a process called, I believe it's called squanning? Scanning. Oh, yeah. Scanning. I, I, I didn't know you were going to talk about that. Yes, yeah, scanning. S-Q-A-N-N-I-N-G. Okay. It was the Q that threw me. So Yeah, um... everybody has trouble with it. Everybody <laughs> goes, how do you do that? Which makes me realize it's a terrible choice of names. But um, I just wanted to reference the idea of scanning, as in scanning your body. And I threw a cue in there, but I realized it's caused a lot more confusion than anything. But yeah, <laughs> I, uh, I do. I do that. I do it religiously. I do it for myself. Uh, occasionally, yeah. I'll get into a stretch of time when I'm not busy with another project, and I will live stream a session every day. Now it's been several weeks because I've got caught up on other projects. But there's enough there, I feel, to keep people um, informed if they're interested. Every session is basically the same. So it's, I could have one session up there and it would be as good as the 70 or 80 or 200 I've done now. Um, I do it live because um, if people are interested in asking questions about the process during the session, they can type it in and I will answer live. So that's why I do sure. that. Uh, but yes, okay. yes. Yeah. So I was, what I was hoping is that you'd, because uh, to me, it looks like you're, you're, you're doing a form of meditation, relaxing, relaxation therapy, something along those lines. Kind of fill us in exactly what's, now that I know what it's called, scanning is and and why you use it and, and how it's how it's helped you. Sure. And I will try not to go on and on about it because I'm kind of obsessed with it. Um, okay. Let's see, what's the briefest way to do this? So first of all, the definition of scanning is the incremental release of muscular tension to achieve a deep state of physical, emotional, and mental calm. At its most basic, scanning is muscular release. So people say to me, is it meditation? I go, not exactly. It may bring you into a meditative state, but what we're dealing with is strictly, and it's been distilled down to the very simple process of releasing muscular tension. And I always demonstrate that by telling someone either to make a fist and then three, two, one, release, or squeeze their hands together, same thing, three, two, one, release. So what you've done is you've made a conscious decision to release muscular tension. So that's the fundamental core of scanning. Now why? Okay. Why, 
why use this process? And, and in the course of a session, we will go through the body. There'll be some warm ups, but we'll work our way through the body, what I call the muscular zones, piece by piece, releasing muscular tension in the shoulder, the chest, the back, the butt. And you do this yourself over the course of a 15 minute, half hour session. What happens, it's incremental, I say, because initially there's some resistance, but you start to discover you have the ability to release muscular tension ever so small. And you might say, I can't release the tension in my neck. Well, try it. Can you release it? 1%. Can you go from this to this? So you start to discover you have that ability and it's cumulative. So as you start to cycle through the body from here down to the feet and then do it again, incrementally releasing tension, what starts to happen is there's a buildup and eventually your body completely lets go and you are completely relaxed. Now, what is the benefit of that? So there's the mind body connection, we call it. We've heard about this before. Mm -hmm. What happens to your mind affects your body. What happens to your body affects your mind. Right. So scanning is definitely in the, in the realm of body-mind connection. And the theory is, if you can relax the muscles of your body, your mind, like a muscle, will follow suit. As you begin to relax individual parts of your body, the rest starts to kind of fall in place mm -hmm. and yield to this. And your mind is like a muscle of sorts too. But instead of holding on to, let's say, this pen, it holds on to what? Thoughts. Mm -hmm. So as your body starts to relax, your mind starts to follow, it lets go, and those troublesome thoughts and worries and concerns and anxieties just float away, and you're left in a state of still, calm, peaceful silence. And you can stay there as long as you want. Now, it's a place we rarely get to in this modern age. People meditate to get there. People take drugs to get there. People drink alcohol to get there. We all want to get there. We're desperate to get there. We're so right. what I call overly contracted. We need to expand to balance our life. This is a way to get to an expanded state. Now, once you've got there, there's nothing like it. It's so relaxing, it's so calm, it's so peaceful, you're gonna to wanna to go back there. But it takes practice because we all don't want to let go. When we're contracted, we're holding on to thoughts, holding on to muscular tension. We don't wanna let go because we think our life will fall apart. But you have to train yourself so that you get to where, even though it feels uncomfortable to let go, you trust the process and you get better and better at muscular release, which in turn relaxes your mind and it brings you to this calm, still, quiet place. What you want in life is a balance. You need to be contracted to get things done. You need to be contracted to run this session. I need to be contracted to hear talking to you. I'm forming words, sentences, ideas, that's contraction. Right. But you need to balance your life with equal amounts of expansion. So as you start to bring scanning into your life, it brings that balance into your life until you get to what we call centered. And that's what you want. Mm -hmm. You don't want to stop contracting and you don't want to be a you know, wet rag that lies around doing nothing. You want a balanced life. Right. Scanning is a way to get you into a more balanced uh, existence. And I think, I think that pretty much sums it up. Um, you, it's, it's easy to learn. You can learn it in two seconds. You can practice for a minute. You can practice for an hour. You're in total control. But what it does, it gives you more control over your state of being, your state of existence. So you, you don't have to feel so out of control like we so often feel in life. So often we feel like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what to do. I don't Money, you know, the pandemic, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking. And we don't know how to get ourselves to a place where we can think more clearly and be more successful in our work and in our lives and in our relationships, that calm, still place. We don't know how to get there. So we rush for alcohol or drugs, which is what I call an external process. That's, a, that's something you outside of you that you use to expand, or you can learn to do it yourself. Use your own abilities mm -hmm. to get to a calm place. That's the goal. Okay. Now, one of the reasons why this caught my attention is my daughter has, has chronic pain and, and you know, she's a chronic pain sufferer. Yes. Have, you, have you had much success with people who have had chronic pain? Absolutely. Absolutely, 100%. Um, I have aches and pains in my body. I was a dancer for years. I have the same issues most people have, knees, back, neck, you name it, trouble sleeping, mm -hmm. all the standard things. Absolutely. The, the reason I'm so committed to this technique is because it absolutely works. So much of the discomfort we have in our life is the result of contraction. Muscles contract to protect you. The reason you get a spasm is your body says, something's hurting you, hold it, don't move until we figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. Now, eventually you'll relax and that spasm in the back, whatever will go away. But pain is frequently your body telling you you're in trouble. Now that can be psychological, that can be physical, but on some level you're overly contracted. You need to expand and let go. So scanning unquestionably can help with pain relief. It can help with psychological stress. 
Uh, and I'm not selling this. This isn't something I make money off of. Right. Never charge for it. Uh, I'm not. There's no book that's ever going to be written about it. It's something that works for me that I'm literally so excited about that I have. I feel compelled to share. Anyone right. who ever wants to can contact me. I will give them a private session. This is just something that I recognize to be a universal benefit. And okay. uh, I believe that in sharing it, it actually helps me because I think holding on to an idea is another form of <laughs> So letting go right. of it, letting it go and sharing it is a way of healing. So I would say yes, and I, I would recommend your daughter try it or some form of it. Uh, everyone's unique. Uh, some people this doesn't work for, that's fine. Uh, it works for me and I, I would recommend to anyone that at any point in your day, you try to muscularly relax incrementally, I think you will feel the benefit and you, you'll, you'll wanna do it more. Okay, awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, like I said, I've, I've watched a few sessions and, mm -hmm. and uh, and I've tried to do it. Mm -hmm. um, Takes to not. Yeah, and, it, and I'll be honest with you. I probably was not as fully attentive as to what you were doing on the screen and, and why. <laughs> sure. Because I probably should have been. Yeah. I was just, because honestly, the first time I'm like, what is Larry doing? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but well, you know, you after know. that, I, I started watching because I was then I became interested as like mm -hmm. this. I saw this becoming a repeated thing. It wasn't just that that one time that you hopped on. You know, like, oh, yeah. look, he's on Facebook Live and he's. Breathing. Yeah. Okay. And well, then I'll I realized you, it was something this. more. I'll tell you this. Um, first of all, um, what I tell people all the time is scanning is just as hard for me today as it was the first day I did it because I am naturally contracted by nature. I think, I talk, I worry, all the things we all do. I never, my body never wants to let go or relax. There's always resistance. There's always a fight. What I've learned through doing it for literally, literally thousands of hours is that if I can just get past that initial resistance, I will get past it and I'll relax. So that's that's what I've gained from doing it for years. For the newcomer, the hardest thing is trusting that that thing that feels so scary and weird and wrong and boring and uh, difficult to pay attention to is something they'll get better at if they just stay with it. So, okay. you know, like I said, I've done thousands and thousands of hours of it. So I know it works and I know how difficult it is. And all I can say to anyone who's tried it and finds it frustrating, yes, the reason you're frustrated is because you're up against your own contraction. And that's a good sign. That means you've got a lot of resistance built up in you. So you've hit gold. If you can get past that, what's on the other side is bliss. But you have to stay with it. Like anything, practice, practice, practice. You know. All right. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Sure. I'm glad to. As I said, anyone who wishes to contact me just anytime, just contact me via Facebook or whatever, and I'd be happy to talk about it because I'm, I'm, I'm a total devotee. You know. Go ahead. Excellent. I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're perfectly home. And on a uh, slightly less shitting topic, <laughs> our Facebook group has 160,000, and it's just filled with memes of this universe and that universe. And it's a crossover a lot of times. So what two universes of your characters would you like to see come together to either work together in some fashion or be in the same universe, be against each other, like what? Wow, that's a good question. Um, when I think back, there's been so many different universes. Uh, that I take pride in 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 the in the fact that there there are so they're so diverse. I, I guess unfortunately, I'm the kind of person that once I've left something, I'm I move on, and I don't think about. I mean, like I talk about shows like Deadwood and things like that, but I don't think about bringing anything back. Uh, so it's hard to say. Um, I guess the closest thing, the closest thing that I that has happened, is I, I would the world of King Lear, which is theater, mm -hmm. which is the best theater experience I may have ever had, and the world of Deadwood, which was Shakespearean in nature. And I almost felt like I was doing Shakespeare when I was doing Deadwood because the writing was so good and the stakes were so high and the characters were so extreme. So I, I would like to see those two come together. I think that'd be very very mm -hmm. interesting. The Old West meets Elizabethan you know, um, Elizabethan royalty. I mean, they're kind of the same in a way. So that would be very interesting. I think they could actually live together. I think they could live happily together. You know, um, if I was to see, if I was to see two opposing worlds come together, well, one would be the Twilight Zone, where I played this monster on the wing, coming together <laughs> with a children's show I did called Square One TV. I mean, <laughs> talk about opposing opposites, a mashup of those two the creature on the wing and a character from Square One TV would, would be mind-blowing, mind-blowing. Mm. 
So, Absolutely. Interesting Who question. Creature on the wing. I did not. Yeah, yeah. There's something. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, all right. So, Larry, I'm I'm a huge Star Wars fan, massive Star Wars fan, and uh, you were part of a couple Star Wars games in the not too distant past. Yes. Uh, where you did some some voice acting there, and yes. I always love to talk to people who are involved in the Star Wars universe in any form and fashion. Um, now, but I always want to know: Were you a fan going into the series that that you worked on, the, the game series that you worked on, or was this just a, a, a check for you? Well, it's never just a check. I mean, yeah, uh, there's some jobs. There's a handful of jobs that I just consider to check. And if it's just a check, I'm miserable because I don't want to do it just for the check. So that hasn't happened very often. So it definitely wasn't just a check. Fair enough. But I will admit to you, and this is a little embarrassing. I am not a fan, not a fanboy. I don't get obsessed with franchises or anything. I find them all equally interesting. If I'm lucky enough to be a part of them, I, I learn a few things about them and I join in. But I, honest to God, don't know much about the Star Wars universe. Uh, I don't know much about any of these worlds per se, except for what I did in it. And uh, because I Fair feel enough. like to get stuck in something is to limit me from my next thing, which may be very different. So um, I didn't know much about it. I do vaguely remember the character. I think it was somebody English. I think they had an English accent. I can't recall. But uh, it's funny that I do kind of remember the session. But my, my, my um, interest when I get the job is just playing the character, the character. Mm -hmm. As much as I can find out about him, but <clears throat> I don't remember much else aside from that. I'm trying to think. Uh, I always liked the Star Wars movies, but you know, I'm old enough that I I saw the first three, and it was right. it was mind blowing. It was life changing. I remember a guy coming into a class at UCLA. I was in graduate school at UCLA, and a guy came in, and his teacher wasn't there, and he was, "You guys, you're not gonna believe this movie I saw last time." We're like, "What? Star Wars?" And I go, well, "What is it?" He goes, "He goes, I just want to tell you this one part. At one point, they're sitting on this." The ship, and they go to what was it called when they went to warp speed and the stars go flying by? Them. Oh yeah, light speed. No one had ever seen anything like this. No one had done anything in the movies where they actually took you in past light speed. And he was so excited. So I remember seeing that and Yoda <laughs> and, and then Darth Vader, and it was just that. Now I got to be honest with you, the the newest ones I've seen one or two of them. It doesn't have it. it doesn't have that same simplicity, uh, right. that same magic of the original story. Um, so yeah, I don't run out to see them. Uh, uh, I'm much more into psychological dramas, more low key human type movies, you know, just about people talking to each other and, Fair getting enough. Rich, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. but yeah. it's all the same to me. If I'm hired to do star Wars and I find whoever that character is and, uh, I live in that world, you know, so. Fair enough. Hmm. I like that answer. We're good yeah. with that. And you also did a lot of things on Star Trek. You could say you're part of the alumni of the Deep Space sure. Nine, Voyager, and Enterprise. And our, our Facebook group, they also love Star Trek as well as Star Wars. And out of those, uh, any of the Star Trek jobs, do you have like any like background stories that you could like share with the group? Sure. Let's see. I did Deep Space Nine. I think on that one, I had this kind of weird hair that went up like that. I was a scientist. And I got killed. That was cool. <laughs> then I did another guy who had the, the full headpiece and everything, and I sat at a table negotiating some deal. I remember that. I don't remember which one that was. Then I did another one, which was my favorite, and that was with Scott Bakula. Which one was that? Uh, uh, Enterprise. Correct. Enterprise, yeah. And um, for that, all I had on me, because I've worn a lot of prosthetics, but all I had on me was like a forehead piece. It gave me this kind of strange forehead. Um, and number one, Scott Bakula is amazing. Just the greatest guy, great actor. It was a pleasure to work with him. Uh, but I remember, I remember our scene. We had a scene together. Uh, it was kind of like a tractor device, and he comes to me to tell me he wants to help us fight the Klingons. And I'm kind of resistant to that because you know what good is he going to do? They're just going to come back. And I'm kind of, and I remember starting that scene and thinking, oh man, I'm with Scott Bakula. He's such a great actor. <laughs> you know, I hope I don't just just totally mess up this scene. And what do I do? And we're practicing, we're blocking, rehearsing, and it's not going well. And I'm thinking, no, no, this is my opportunity. This is a scene, a real scene. I'm like, I'm, I'm close, it's me. And, and, then, and then I had a real revelation as an actor because I started to get really pissed off, really annoyed at the fact that I couldn't figure out what the scene was. And suddenly a light bulb went off of me that my character was annoyed. My character's annoyed. So quit trying to find the character, trying to find the scene, just play how you're feeling. You're annoyed. 
and you're frustrated with this guy, Scott Bakula, because he's asking you questions you, you don't know what the answer is. So just go with that. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm terrible as an actor. I'm so angry. And I get, That's the scene. So if you look at that scene, and I always remember that when I look at it, that was like one of the greatest acting lessons I ever had because you can actually see me learning in that scene to just play how I felt. What I'm playing in that scene is how I felt that night. And whenever I see it, I'm reminded that if ever I'm on a set and I don't know what to do in a scene, just go with whatever you're feeling, whatever you're feeling. If you love that other actor, and you just want to hug him and embrace him, just go with that. If you're annoyed with him and you want to punch him in the face, go with that. Whatever's real will work because, you know, people don't realize this. You can get on a set in a scene as an actor and not know what the heck you're doing. It happens all the time. I've been doing this for 40 some years. Tomorrow I could get cast in something, show up on the set and they go action. I go, what do you mean action? I don't know what the hell I'm doing here. I don't know what I'm doing. What do I play? It's terrifying. They call acting a slippery art because you never really have it in hand. It can slip away at any moment. So the interesting memory I have from that is that particular moment. And I was so grateful because the scene ended up being terrific. Um, and I had such a great time and I was so proud to do a scene with Scott Bakula and, uh, yeah, it was a very good memory. My memories are always about the acting. You know, uh, that's the thing that always strikes me. What was the acting experience like? And that was a real education that oh. night. That so, makes sense to me, though. It. That's something that's uh, near and dear to your heart. So why wouldn't it be your memories be about yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to go back and watch that episode. Yes. Yeah, and you will see. You will see how annoyed I am. <laughs> how, it, how, it works, how it works for the scene. Um, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Well, Larry, this has been a lot of fun, but before we can truthfully let you go, we do have yeah. a little quiz we like to run our guests through. Okay. Uh, so it's a five question quiz. Sure. All, all the questions are multiple choice. Oh. So we do try to make it a little bit easier for you. Okay. However, uh, out of the five questions, if you get three of the questions right, we do want to send you one of these handy dandy I gave to the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund coffee mugs. Oh my God. Now the pressure's on. I got to have that mug. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Nick, I'm hoping you have a copy of the book with you because uh, I can't see the video. Um, do not actually. All right. So uh, our, our book, our, our book, our group was, was founded by, by Nick's dad who goes, writes under the pen name of Drayton Allen. Oh, and wow. Drayton wrote a book. We'll sh I'll show this one. It's called, and we'll send you both books if, uh, if you win it. But, uh, uh, Custodians of the Cosmos, and it's all about a young man who wanted to join something similar to Starfleet, uh, yeah. but couldn't hack it. He washed out, and he rejoined as a custodian to, ah, bold, to, boldly, to boldly clean up after those who had boldly just went. Oh, that's hysterical. Uh, I love and, that. And he's got a new book out called Dances with Aliens, where it's about a, uh, a dog, but not a four-legged dog, but a singing, dancing cartoon dog of a theme, from a theme park, and trying to figure out why all these intelligent aliens can figure out all these different travel things and, but not realize that he's a dog or a guy in a dog suit rather. Oh man, um, that's great. Good so, stuff. I got to so have yeah. this. So three <laughs> at three questions, we'll send you just the mug. Four oh, questions, right. we'll send you the books and the mug. Okay. Now are these, are these questions about things I might know about, or are they just kind of out of these are know. this, this quiz is called the year of the movie. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you three movie names. Oh shoot. Okay. And I can't go on the internet and look, can I? I can't sneak a look at IMDb or anything. Okay, I, I, I know, I know, I know nothing. I know. Nothing. <laughs> uh, okay. We'll give you three movie names, and sure. then we're going to give you uh, three years, and you'll have, be able to chase. Uh, did those three movies come out in one of those three years? Oh, okay. No, I'm terrible at that kind of stuff. Okay, I'll try. I'll try. Okay. Oh my God. I have All a couple right. of reference points in my life where I might be able to do it. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Now here's here's the the opposite. If there's good things that come, there also has to be what we call a fun sequence. Okay. And so if you get less than three questions correct, we'd like to take a picture of you, make a meme out of you, and put it in our Facebook group. That's fine. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll, of course, share that meme with you uh, as okay. well. So you'll see. All right. <laughs> you'll, you'll get to see what everybody else gets to see. Uh, okay. I wish I was better on my movie trivia. Okay, go on. Horse Gump, Toy Story, and Apollo 13 came out in which year? 1998. 1992 or 1995. Okay, Forrest Gump, Apollo 13, and Toy Story. Toy Story. 98, 92, or 95. Those seem like those came out like a while back to me. Um, it's going to be 92 or 95. 
Toy Story, Forrest Gump, Apollo 13. God, I love all those movies. Uh, Apollo 13 especially. That seems like a long time ago. Because yeah. um, cause, uh, the director of uh, Apollo 13 was Ron, um, you know, from o OB. Yeah, Ron and Howard. He's, Ron Howard. He's done so many movies since. Uh, 92 might be too early. But Forrest Gump seems like, I'm going to say 95. I'll say, all right. I'll say yes. you're correct. <laughs> I knew it was 98 and 92 is too far. Oh, I can't believe I did that. I never am good at this stuff. Okay. All right. All right. Question two. That's one. Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, Star Wars, Episode Two, Attack of the Clones, and Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Did those movies come out in 2000, 2002, or 2010? Say the movies again. Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, Star Wars, Episode Two, Attack of the Clones, or and Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Oh, Where the years available are 2000, 2002, and 2010. It's not 2000. And 2002 seems like a long time ago. I'm going to say like a clue. What's that? Would you like a clue? Yes. Okay. Lord of the Rings, two towers, Star Wars, episode two. <laughs> and give me the years again. 2000, 2002, or 2010. Oh. Yeah, I think it might be 2002. Am I right? There you go. Yeah. All right. Thanks for that. <laughs> I just <laughs> made that connection of the clue. I was going to go 2010, oh. but that did seem pretty recent. So, you know, I might actually go on with 2002. You know, I just go by where was I in my life when those came out, and that's my reference point. Oh, well, thanks for that. Thanks for the help. I appreciate yeah, it. I'm no going away. Away. away from All that right. cup. All right. Here we go. Okay. Question three. We're going to take, take it back a little bit. Okay. So Star Trek, the motion picture. James Bond, Moonraker, and Alien, was it 77, 80, or 79? This, this, this has got to be... Wait, tell me the Star Wars one again. Uh, Star Trek, the motion picture. Oh, Star Trek. James oh. Bond, Moonraker, and Alien. And the years are 77, 80, and 79. 77, 79, or 80. Well, 77 is not 77. I'm pretty sure, because Star Wars came out in 77, the first one. 77, 79, and 80? I would say 1980. Nope, it's 79. Ah, All right, I knew it wasn't 77. <laughs> I want to, ah, oh, shoot. Because 70, because Alien, yeah, yeah, boy. These are movies that had a real impact on me too. So, but I just can't put it together with the years. All right. So I still got to get one more. All right. You got two chances. Okay. All right. Question four. Ocean's 13. Was that June. the last one? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Ocean's 13, Juno, and the mm -hmm. Born Ultimatum. Mm -hmm. Was it 2007, 2001, or 2003? Oh, it's got to be 2007. Correct. Good, yeah, because that that's way too far back for those. Those are more recent. All right, so I got it. I got the cup. We're going to send you the cup. Woo! Uh, I'm so relieved. All right, and question. Look. Go ahead. We got The Breakfast Club, Back to the Future, and Mad Mac Beyond Thunderdome. Okay. Was it the first back, you're talking about the first Back to the Future, right? The very first yes. one. Yes, okay. Back to the Future 1. Okay. 1960, 1985. Or 2000. Oh, this one's easy because Back to the Future, I'll tell you a story. The guy working across the street from me was working on Back to the Future. And he came home one day and he said, they had this actor who was playing the lead and they fired him. They got this new guy, Michael J. Fox. Remember that story? Yeah. Uh, uh, Eric Stoltz was playing it. Yep. So I remember him telling me that story. He lived across the street from us. He, the movie wasn't a hit yet because it hadn't come out. He was just telling us about this movie he was working on. So that was 19. My daughter, we were in the first house we lived in. With my first daughter, she was born in 1985, so it's 1985. There you go. Nice. Yeah. All right. Whoa. So, so you, we'll send you the books and the and the coffee mug as a uh, thank you Fantastic. for being on the show. And I earned them. You I did earn them. So I really am going to appreciate them. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, Larry, thank you so much for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go to find out more about what you are doing now or 
Twitter, Facebook, whatever you'd like to give us. Sure. Well, there's my Facebook page. You can do a search and you'll come up with my Facebook page, which is, you know, just Larry Cedar. I also have, I guess what they call a, it's not a fan page, but it's my professional page also on Facebook, which is basically facebook.com slash Larry Cedar actor. I post mostly the same things. I just tend to post the personal stuff on my, the regular Facebook page and the professional on the other one. So they can go to my website, Larry Cedar uh, dot com and they can see videos of me and I don't update it too often, but that's there. I also have an Instagram page and Twitter page. Instagram is uh, Larry Cedar actor and Twitter is just Larry Cedar. And uh, I try to post, I try to keep people updated. The, the thing is these days when you do a job, the first thing they tell you when you get down there is you can't tell anyone about it until it's on the air. So like I just did right. a really cool job, which I can't talk about, but it'll be up soon enough. So that's where um, they can reach me and they can of course message me. And uh, it's, it's always a thrill to have people, friend me and and just stay in touch with me and i always appreciate that so oh and i can tell you also uh maybe uh, i do these one-man shows these adaptations of literature and i just did one and i'm working on my next one for kafka's Fran kafka's franz kafka's the trial which will be coming out in february but there'll be news about that so that's it but in the meantime i want to thank you guys this has been a blast you guys are terrific and uh it's been a pleasure so thank you yeah. thank you yeah and thank you. And we will make sure we put those links in our show description sure. so that listeners can check them out as well. Fantastic. And thank you to your fans. And uh, thanks for, for liking the business. You know, I yeah. do. So I'm glad you do too. And just one more quick thing here. Just want to remind everybody that subscribing is the single most important thing that you can do to ensure that we get more amazing guests to have these types of conversations with Larry Cedar here. Funny moments for you to be able to listen to. So please subscribe. It's going to help us out and then go check out larry's work as well check him out on on social media he does a lot of cool stuff on there and uh now that i know how to pronounce it go check out scanning yes uh, that's also a page there's a scanning page on facebook just just do a search for s-q-a-n-n-i-n-g that's there it. you go all right now also if you're not happy with the content of our show today all you have to do is and you can do this by on your own uh lodge a complaint with the head of our complaint department that of course is thomas curry aquaman's dad Sure, he seems like a nice and even-keeled kind of fella, but it's his stepson of sorts that you got to worry about, Orm. That kid, he's something's wrong. He's always running ahead of things and trying to make himself look good and, and anything Aquaman-related look bad. But either way, the offending party will be dealt with. Just depends on who's dealing out the justice, whether it's Thomas or Orm. Pray for Thomas. Well, thanks again, Larry. I want to add one more thing I forgot. I do have a YouTube channel. Just do a search for Larry. Okay. And if you want to see, it's basically got clips from everything I've done. So if you're curious about that on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe. That's it. Thank you. Very good. All right. All right, All right guys. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Larry, thank you for being here. My pleasure. Good to talk to you guys. Take care. Bye. Our show is brought to you by our charity sponsor, the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund, which support the Wish Upon a Teen Foundation that helps out sick kids from Angel of Health. And just imagine the comfort you'll give redshirt room number eight. He'll know that when he puts on the red shirt and joins the community study group only to get shot first in paintball, he'll know that he didn't leave his family destitute and without hope because the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund has his back and the reward him. And speaking of sponsors and show partners, check out this short video from our good friends over at Level Up Lightsabers. Information about Level Up Lightsabers and their online training sessions can be found in the episode description below. On behalf of the rest of the hosts of Funny Science Fiction, we'd like to thank you for listening to this episode. If you'd like to be a guest on one of our future episodes, please contact us by means of our Facebook group, Funny Science Fiction. You can find us on Twitter or Instagram using the handle at Funny Sci-Fi, or you can go to DraytonAllen.com and click the Contact Me link at the bottom of the page. Thanks again. Hope you enjoyed the episode.